Great. Uh, we're, we're good to go. Okay. Take it away, my friend. All right, everybody. All right, my name is Josh. Uh, seriously, I'm so glad to be here. What a, what a privilege. It's been a rough... Uh, Years? It's been like a million years, yeah, since, since he and I got to hang out, and I'm just really glad to, to be here. I, I do, so he was, um, um, and has always been very generous, and so w one of the things that he helped me with was that when I was writing that book, I needed a great uh, artifact repository, and so, you know, he used to work, you might have heard of, anyway, I know, surely you don't know about that, but anyway, he, uh, he let me have access to one, and I used it for that book, and it was good, and I think we even called him out because he was like super good to it. To, the, to both of us. So I appreciate you, my friend. You've always been good. Um, uh, okay, so my friends, my name is Josh Long. I work on the spring team. I'm super glad to be here. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just nice to be here. I'm in, um, I'm in Nashville. You got, you've got the things I want, uh, uh, but I cannot have all year, right? Which is really good loud music, whiskey, and barbecue. And of course, it's a great visit. This is exactly what I want. I want a great visit, and I'm going to have it tonight. This is going to be an amazing place. So I'm really glad to be here, um, and uh, I'm glad to talk about spring. I'm, it's just we're in a very interesting place. You know, Java uh, and and spring are in a very interesting place, and and I say it's the most interesting time uh, to be a Java and Spring developer ever, right? In terms of all of the history of 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 things that have come and gone. And by the way. The reason I'm qualified to talk about all this is because I work on the Spring Team and, I, and I've got a YouTube channel. It's not great. Subscribe and like right now. It's probably not the worst mistake you'll make this year. Um, and, uh, and there's my email, so should you have questions when, ineluctably, uh, this thing goes off the rails and you're wondering what the heck you just watched and why you did it, you can send those emails to me at that address there, josh at joshlong.com. Uh, so anyway, as I was saying, back to where, oh, in this whole thing, I don't know if this whole, this URL probably still works, but it's got an expiration date, you would think, right? Uh, I don't know if you, any of you were paying attention, but uh, VMware was just acquired uh, by a company called Broadcom. So now I'm technically part of a company called Broadcom. Um, so you do soft hardware and chips now? Yeah, it's uh, technology. We are like Apple, but quieter, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, but we are also, it's very big. I didn't know this. Uh, Broadcom is a very big company. I mean, huge, huge, huge company. It's like Facebook-sized in terms of market cap, you know? Really, really crazy big. Um, uh, so anyway, I don't know what the market cap is anymore, I don't know, but it was big at one point, it was very, very big. Uh, so uh, anyway, all that to say, it's been kind of an interesting, this is my first week, I'm a new employee, I got a new job, but I'm doing the same thing. This has happened to me a lot, you know? Like the spring team, we stay still, and things change around us, you know? So, uh, so for example, I, was on, I joined VMware in 2010 uh, as, this, as, as the first spring developer advocate, uh, and now, uh, well, I'm still spring developer advocate, I'm not even like, I'm not even... I don't, even, I don't even bother, I am, technically I'm like higher up in the rungs, but I don't even have to say it because I've just spring developer advocate, right, it's enough. And then, uh, and then we, what happened? We, f we spun out and formed Pivotal, and that was fun, and then uh, VMware bought that company up like seven years later, so, and then we've been back at VMware for like three years, and now we're at Broadcom, right? Uh, and so, so uh, and that's why I don't give you my company email, okay, because they change it every two weeks, <laughs> and uh, nobody will be able to email me. So it's here, okay? Josh at joshlong.com. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited. We've, it's just an amazing time to be a Java and, and Spring developer. And I say that fully aware of where we've come from. If you look at this, this is, uh, we, you know, to celebrate at our big old tentpole uh, conference earlier this year uh, in, in, uh, in uh, August, we had Spring One in Vegas, which is a place you can go if you don't want to do things that are normal. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, we had this big conference, and we had this nice website, springone.io, history of spring, and uh, you can play along as well. You can use, if you, you know, it's the history of spring. 20 years this year since the first release of something called spring, right? Spring Framework 1.0 came out uh, in 2004, which is 19 years ago, but the early access build came out in 2003. So the, the first thing that looked and had the same package structure and call, it was called spring framework, the early access build that came out in 2003. Uh, and so, we, and you can see the code, you know, started percolating around 2002, 2001, uh, and uh, you can see, we've, it's just been a long journey, 2003, uh, Spring Framework 1.0 was released, Spring Security 2.0 was renamed from a CG, uh, we've got, I missed that, oh, sad, Spring Boot 1.0, so again, 10 years now of something called Spring Boot. So the early access builds for Spring Boot 1.0, the first public release we did was in 2013. 
Uh, and now here we are, 2023, so 10 years since that, and next year will be, uh, and then 1.0 came out in uh, 2014. Uh, April 1, by the way, April 1 is when we released Spring Boot 1.0. Makes it easy to remember. Um, and then Spring Batch, and then uh, what else do we got here? We got uh, Spring Negation, okay, great, moving up into the clouds, very subtle, subtle uh, thing. We're in the clouds, Spring Cloud 1.0 is released. Uh, Spring Cloud Task, Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Cloud Data Flow, going back down in the water, Kubernetes, mar maritime themes, right? Spring Cloud Data Flow for Kubernetes, uh, and uh, Spring Cloud Skipper, and uh, Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes, and uh, we got the Spring Boot, and this came out 2022, so this is last year. And you know when this came out? Because remember, 1.0 came out April Fools, 2014. Can you guess when last, week, last year's release came out? Thanksgiving Day. Famously, nothing else is happening that day, so it seems like a really great day to release it. Uh, no, I don't know why we released it on, 20, uh, on, on Thanksgiving Day here in the US. And by the way, for those of you, uh, those Canadians in the room, I'm talking about the Thanksgiving in November, not the one that you celebrate in Canada in, in October. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, so that was great. I, I, I was busy. And then, uh, and, then we, and then at the same time, we also cut over to a six month release cadence. So now there's a new release of Spring Boot every six months. Okay, uh, which means, friends, guess what happened exactly a year later? Guess what happened? Yeah, we released another version of Spring Boot on Thanksgiving Day. Terrible, terrible, terrible time of the year to release a release, but we did. That's because we're, that's how we roll. So, so we have a Spring Boot and uh, 20 years and, uh, you know, look at that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Spring. Congratulations on 20 years of innovation. Celebrate with us in the past at Spring One and play uh, push button B to continue your quest. So good stuff, good stuff. I really, it's just an amazing time. And so we now have Spring Boot 3.2. That just dropped uh, like, like, like a, uh, exactly seven days ago, last Thursday, right? Uh, and we also have Java 21, which came out in September. And we are now uh, well on our way to Java 22 which completes, for me, the trinity. There's like a number of features that I have been waiting for. I ask yourself this hypothetical, hypothetical question. What would you have needed if you could have gone back in time with whatever technology we had available today? What would you have needed to go back in time and persuade the, uh, the people building Kubernetes in 2012 and 2011 and so on to persuade them to use Java instead of Go? Right? It's a thought experiment. Just, it's too late. We're not going to do it. Don't do it. It's, it would be absolutely mental to do that. Don't do that. Right? We're never going to, don't ever do that. It's a terrible, terrible idea. There's hundreds of millions of human hours already invested in Kubernetes, in the ecosystem writ large. You'll never overcome that. So don't do that. I'm, but, but also, just hypothetically, what would it have taken? And I think there's three things that made Go, at the time, more persuasive uh, than what Java offered at the time. Again, this is 10, 15 odd years ago. Uh, the first is small, statically linked, self-contained binaries, GraalVM, okay, we got that. The other one is Go routines and easy, lightweight threading and scalability. Guess what, Project Loom is here. Uh, and then the third bit, the final piece, the missing piece, is uh, easy foreign function interop, and that's Project Panama, and guess when that comes out? Java 21. 22, oh god. Oh. Oh. You stay after class to clean the board. So, so, so that's Why coming. <laughs> well, no, I mean, whatever. It, it's, it's coming. It's going to be here in four months. So then Java 22, take that. And now, you know, I, I just, it's, it's very, I, I, don't know what, I, I don't know if you can appreciate what I'm trying to tell you, but it's very rare. It's very, very rare. I live in Silicon Valley, okay? And in Silicon Valley, uh, I am a dinosaur. I have been at the same company for 13 plus years. Most people, like, they get their st stock, stay for two years, and then dip in Silicon Valley. That's just the way of the world over there, right? You know, you used to live in that area. It's very, 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 very sort of uh, mercenarial. I don't know, it's very, very short-lived. So anyway, in Silicon Valley, you tell someone you're using Java, and they will literally become sadder, right? <laughs> There's just some arrogance about it, right? And I'm just saying, friends, it's time. It's finally time. We can be arrogant now. <laughs> we, we, they, have, they have earned what's about to come to them, right? We have the ability to say, hey, you should really get a good language. You should try Java. This Go stuff is not going to work for you. It's just bad, you know? We're here. We finally have this amazing moment in time. So enjoy it, 
Four more months, Java 22. And then, yeah, amazing. Um, so friends, let's talk about it. Spring Boot 3.2 just came out, uh, like I said, just a, just a week ago. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of those new features in the wide and wonderful world of Spring. Uh, and we're gonna do that as always by going to my second favorite place on the internet. Obviously my first favorite place is production. I love production. You too should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you have never been to production, you begin your journey here at start.spring.io. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a brand new application. Friends, I had a New Year's resolution uh, earlier this year, January, uh, that's when people make their resolutions, to learn Gradle and to lose some weight. And um, anyway, the Gradle was going really well. Okay, it was going really well. Uh, but then Java 21 came out and there's a brief couple of months where there's like, uh, I think it's Kotlin. Was, was Kotlin the thing that was causing them to? It's Kotlin's fault, right? Uh, and, I, and that makes me sad because if you, if you were paying attention, uh, I'm also a Kotlin Google developer expert. So, awkward. Uh, anyway, all that to say, all that to say, it's finally basically here. It, uh, 8.5, I guess, released last night. I did a pre-run right before we, right, just 10, 20 minutes ago. Uh, I, I hit some issues. I'll discuss those later. But my point is, in, very, very, in a sh very short amount of time, you're gonna be able to use Gradle and Java 21. But that moment, for me, hasn't arrived. It'll be another six hours <laughs> or whatever. But so in the, for, just for now, because I'm a terrible person and I make terrible life decisions, I'm gonna use Maven, okay? Gosh. I know, I know. Gosh. I'm not happy, I'm not proud of it. It's just the way I, I found a, a thing. I gotta like ask questions later. So we're gonna use that. Um, and and then, then, my friends, we have, we have choices we have to make down here. What do we wanna name the service? Well, I'm gonna name the service, service. And, and the reason I'm gonna name it service is because I'm amazing with names. Just really amazing. I get that from my father. He also was amazing with names. He's also Josh. Huh? He's also Josh. He's also Josh. No, no, but, but we had, when I was a little boy, uh, uh, we had a small white dog and my father named him White Dog. Now this, <laughs> this, this dog, I swear, he was with us for like 10 years. And then I don't know what happened. Maybe he got a job or something. I don't know. But then he left. Okay. My parents never told me. Uh, and so, so then magically, uh, another. And again, it seemed perfectly plausible at the time. Looking back, I realize maybe, maybe he didn't get a job. But uh, anyway, that, that a few weeks later, a few months later, whatever, another small white dog magically appeared at our front door, the screen door, tapping on the door, looking for a new home. And so we took him in. And my father named him. Two. Now I'm not sure if I'm not sure if this is T O O or T W O. Either way, great with names, amazing, amazing. Uh, uh, and that's where I get that from my father. Now that said, my mom tells me all the time. She says, "You're very lucky that I named you." And um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's probably true. Okay, friends. Then we have another choice down here. Notice that we dropped those other versions. You see, in order to use Spring Framework Six and later, and Spring Boot 3.0, and later, you need to use Java 17, or later. Uh, this, is, this is, we no longer support Java, uh, Spring Boot 2.7 either, end of life, right? It's end of life, you have no reason to be using that in production, we've given you years of time to ramp down and move on, uh, but it's time, it really is time, and by the way, if you're looking for ways to migrate, there's things like open rewrite, right? Have you seen this amazing project? Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. I wasn't. Was here about John, Schne John Schneider, formerly, he, he, you know, he created a micrometer yeah. on the spring team years ago. He was yeah. part of the spring, spring team. team. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he created this project, or he leads it now, and this is a, a project for refactoring your code to move it from one thing to another. And there's even a recipe here for moving, they already did it, upgrading to Spring Boot 3.2. So you can deploy it automatically, or you can, even better, you can pay John, uh, and he's got a SaaS offering, so now you can point it at your whole organization, your whole GitHub org, and just say, upgrade everything, please. And it'll send you, you a pull request. Sorry? You already sold. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's really good. There are ways to get to 3.2. It's not painful. Just, just get it done. You'll be happier you did it. And more to the point, you need to do it. That's the important part, I guess. That's the takeaway, uh, is you need to be on uh, 3.x or later. Actually, 3.1 or later, but you might as well just go to 3.2. So, so we are um, we're using 3.2, but we still have a question here, friends. What version of Java should we use? Definitely not eight. That won't work. 
We've got Java 17. That's the long, last long-term supported version of Java. But friends, we have Java 21 now. And this is, as I say, the most important single release of Java, I think, in its history. Right? Java has come a long way, and I think this is the culmination of that. Uh, it is the single uh, most five important. Was, five was bigger. Not for me. Generics, okay. generics versus this? No, no, no. Just is 1.0 and then 21. That's, that's the history of Java for me. Uh, and uh, <laughs> like, I, it, this is huge. This gives Java a whole new pr uh, life, and we'll talk about that in a while in a minute. But Java 21 is huge. Um, and uh, it's technically superior to what came before in every conceivable way. It's faster, more secure, more robust, more open, more container ready, more performant, more operations friendly. It's also morally superior. <laughs> you won't like the look of sadness and shame in your children's eyes when they find out you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do this. Be the change you want to see in the world. Do the right thing. Upgrade yesterday. Yesterday. Get on this. I'll wait. So we're going to use Java 21. It's amazing. And friends, just judging by, purely by the version number alone, I think we can agree that Java 21 is almost three times greater than Java 8. So I think I've made my case. I think I've made my case. Let's go ahead and make some selections here. We're going to add some dependencies. We're going to add the Gravium native image support. We're going to add the web support. We're going to add the Spring Boot actuator support. We're going to add the Postgres support and test container support and Docker Compose support uh, and data JDBC. Okay. Now I like. Spark. Sorry. Spark. Spark. Yes. Spark. What about it? <laughs> oh my God. I don't know what the, what is, I mean, this yes. Data. Yes, yes it is. I'm more about micro data, small data, yeah, regular data. Data on a diet, you know? Um, so, <sighs> okay, let's go ahead and build this application. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with my selections here. We've got Postgres, we've got GraalVM, we got the web stuff, observability, uh, doc, compose, test containers. Oh, 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 uh, we want dev tools. Um, and uh, I think that's it. I'm pretty sure that's it. You know, all that looks pretty good. Yeah, let's just let's just go let's go with that. Okay, I'm going to hit generate and open this up in my IDE. I've got a little program here. It's called Unzip and Open. It's a Python program and it's it's aliased. So when you see UAO, just know I'm just unzipping the zip and running idea space pom.xml or build.gradle or whatever I have on hand at the moment. Okay, friends. So here's my public static void main. Let me make the font. Bigger, font, hello, font, appearance. Well, first of all, we don't want to sync with the OS. The OS is there. Oh. Good morning. OK, 18, hit apply, hit OK. How, whoop, no, that did nothing. It did nothing. Where is my, um, honestly, this, should, this just used to be so much easier. So this is 18, actually. So. 24? No, nope. 222? How's that? Can you see that in a very far back? No way you can. No way. No, no, Josh, they have, they have multiple screens. They have screens. Oh, fancy. Oh, wow. OK, OK. So there we go. We've got our public static void main. This is our entry point into the application. But friends, I'm trying to live that git clone run life. I want to be able to take my code, git clone it, and start making changes to it immediately. And so to that end, I've also, when I was in the initializer, I selected test container support. And what that has done is it, it spring, the spring initializer created a second public static void main entry point into my program. But this one is in the test folder, right? It's not in the source main Java. It's in source test Java. So source main Java, this is my production code. And here's my, my, my test code. And it's just the same. It's the same thing. It's public static void main. But it's got extra objects. It's got extra configuration specific to my development time experience. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm defining a bean here of type Postgres container. This is from the test containers API, which is a Java abstraction for running uh, Docker images, you know, containers. Uh, and it's uh, our friend Sergey in, over in New York and uh, um, Atomic Jar. Uh, this is a great project, right? Really, really useful. And uh, what I'm doing is I've got a, a Java object, which is a DSL around this container, but you can also just use a generic container and launch in the old thing. However, there are certain kinds of containers, certain kinds of data sources that Spring Boot is aware of. And if you annotate them with at service connection, Spring Boot will automatically figure out how to connect to the newly running instance of that Docker image from your program. So in this case, I'm launching a database. This is actually going to use Docker Desktop, the Docker daemon, rather, and run the Docker image for Postgres on my machine. 
Okay, so the result will be a Docker image over there, not in my Java code, but often off, off to the side in my in my Mac. I want to then have my Spring Boot program talk to that database, right? And but but I don't want to have to do Spring that data source that username, or Spring that data source that password, and all that kind of stuff. So now we have this new thing called at service connection, and this at service connection basically it, it's a way of telling Spring Boot to automatically hydrate a connection to this newly minted container. Uh, and we can do this for other things as well, right? You can also do this for um, Docker Compose. You can connect it to a Docker Compose instance. So if I had wanted to, if I had selected here on the initializer Docker Compose, uh, I did actually, then what you get is a compose.yaml here, right? And so if you, have, if, you're, if you run the main method in the production code with that Docker Compose module on the class path, it'll automatically start this up for you. Anything, if it finds docker-compose.yaml or compose.yaml in this directory or a few, you know, a few directories up, it'll start that automatically and then, and then it'll connect to that for you as well, automatically, okay? And the reason this is good is because now for development, I don't have to have a wiki page with 500 easy steps to development, right? They can just start cloning, get cloning code, right? That's all that matters here. So um, I don't want both Docker Compose and Test Container, so I'm gonna comment that out in these 500 lines of XML, these 5,000 lines of XML, okay? I know, it's my fault, I feel bad about it. Not making it easier. We're gonna start 2024, we're gonna start fresh, new New Year's resolution, I'm gonna reboot the resolution. Um, so, okay, so I've got this, Docker Compose uh, is out for the moment, but I've got the YAML file, that's convenient, I can still use that. Um, make sure you export the port, by the way. Like, if you wanna actually talk to it from your command line to see what's happening, make sure you add that, otherwise it'll just be anonymous. Okay, so I've got this, I've got this annotation. This, in turn, depends on some infrastructure in Spring Boot called a connection details. A connection details was a little bit of indirection. It used to be, you had properties, and then you'd create a data source. So, spring.datasource.url, spring.datasource.username, that password, that, those, those properties would be used to create a new Javax SQL data source. Well, now we've got a little bit of indirection. And the reason we have that indirection is because not all things have passwords. Not all things have usernames. Not all things can be written down. You might just have a way to get the credentials some other way, like, for example, by talking to the Docker daemon API in Java. And so because of that, there's a bit of indirection now. This service connection annotation depends on this new thing called connection details. And this took us a long time to get right you'll see that this interface is actually very, very sophisticated. You can see that uh, it, is, it is just full. And look how many people it took to get this right. There are three committers, no less than three committers involved in making this interface work. Um, and uh, I think the results speak for themselves. Anyway, we have lots of implementations of that, right? So if you're using Docker Compose or test containers, we'll automatically create a connection details object of the right type for that thing. Or if you have properties, we'll create a, a connection details for them, from those properties for that thing, okay? So all roads lead to connection details and then that leads to the actual thing, which is the data source, okay? So now we have our, our test application. Um, this is great, what, so what, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna uh, use DevTools, okay? The core conceit behind DevTools is, hey, spring fast, Java slow. Let's just keep the JVM running and recreate the spring bean factory anew each time rather than restarting the JVM process anew each time, right? The JVM is not known for its exceptionally quick startup time. Uh, and so uh, we've, we've just sort of hacked around that, right? We have this little thing that runs during development. It sees the classes that you've compiled. It loads them into a new class loader, creates a new bean factory with those classes in the, cl in the class loader, throws away the old bean factory in the old class loader, and then your application, your, the JVM is still there, so you don't have to wait for that. So I, uh, this works really well. This, this DevTools thing really works really well unless, unless that is you're starting a Docker image on every single restart, <laughs> which is exactly what I'm doing here, right? So this is gonna slow things up quite a bit. Thankfully, uh, we have an annotation that you can use to tell Spring, hey, don't restart this thing. Just keep this bean definition alive and let it survive the restarts, okay? So I've got, it's called restart scope, okay? There we go, so let's go ahead and run this, okay, run. This is gonna take a long time the first time. Okay, we'll just go ahead and do that. Here we are. So there's the application, you can see it took forever, achingly long time. Uh, it's, and, it, it's, and for understandable reasons, it's actually running a Docker image, waiting for it to spin up. But then you can see it's actually connected. It's got a, a Postgres URL for that instance, it's got a Postgres connection, it's got the data source, it's got all that stuff, and we're in business. But it did take an eternity, okay? 
So I wonder what it would be like. It might have just downloaded a new container. Let me just see what it does from. OK, it's a brand new restart. I just did a restart. There you go. That's more typical. So that's still an eternity, though, right? I don't want to wait 2.3 anything for, for my app to restart, right? OK, that's only because we, we've got this in the mix. If we didn't have that, it would be markedly faster. <sighs> OK, so now I've got my data source. It's time to actually use it. And what I want to do is I want to build a data-centric application. And I suppose the first part here, friends, and by the way, there's a thing in IntelliJ now with the uh, copying and uh, I don't know what this is. So we're going to see if this works. But what I want to do is I want to tell Spring to initialize the database with some SQL files that I'm going to write. Okay? Every time the application starts up, I'll create a, a, a schema.sql. I'll say create table if not exists customer ID serial primary key name var car 255 not null. Okay, so there's my schema. And I'm going to create uh, some data as well, some sample data that we're going to have in the database. And I'll say delete from customer. I'll say insert into customer uh, name values. And then I'm just going to put some names in there. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, the one and only, the amazing, the inimitable Baruch. Okay. We've got uh, yours truly. Hi, nice to meet you. Let's put some other people in the Spring and Java community in there. Um, Madura and Olga and Yushin and uh, Spencer and John. Stefan and who? John. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, what happened to my. Uh oh. No, there used to be a key binding. It's no longer showing me the right keyboard. What did I do? Oh, well, okay, well. I used to be able to type in the accent. I've got, this is new laptop. Who dis? I have to like set that up again. Um, okay, so we got that. John. Okay, good. So there's some people. Okay, friends. So we've got some. we got some people. Uh, we need one more, I think, because otherwise it'll be a. Uh, no, that's right. That's eight. That's eight right there, right? What is that? One, two, three, four. Yeah, eight. Oh, eight. Okay, very good. So that's a nice round number. You can divide it by two, and then two again. It's still two. I'm a fan. So we've got that. Uh, I think it's ready. Let's go ahead and make the change. And this time, I'm not going to restart. I'm going to recompile or rebuild the project. Okay, so on IntelliJ on the Mac, it's Command Shift F9. Whoa, 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 easy. Command Shift F9, right there. Okay, so probably Control Shift F9 on every other operating system ever made. Um, so I'll go ahead and redo that. Here we go, and then you can see down here, it it recreated the context this time in 0.2 seconds. So almost, actually about an order of magnitude faster, right? Faster than a light bulb. Very, very good. So localhost, 8080. Do I have anything there? I don't think I do. But yeah, OK. So good. So it's, the application's up and running. Now, uh, let's actually write some data. Let's write some code to actually talk to that database, OK? And so this is a data-centric application. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a record here uh, to map my entity in the database to a Java object. And I'll create a record here uh, for a customer. And I'm using Spring Data, so I'll use this at annotation. And by the way, I'm using records. I love, I love records so much, so much, y'all. Like it's just so much better. And by the way, don't take this at face grand, at face value here. Uh, records are just a key part, a small part of a whole bunch of new features in Java 21 uh, that uh, Java language architect Brian Gitz uh, is calling data-oriented programming. Have you heard about this? Anybody? Have you seen some of these amazing things? So there's a number of features taken together uh, that, that have been slowly introduced in Java over the intervening years, but that have come finally to completion here in Java 21. And those features are records, pattern matching, smart switch expressions, uh, and um, what was the other one? Records, pattern matching, smart switch expressions, and? String templates. No, that's not here. That's a preview feature. And that, that looks ugly as sin, doesn't it? Have you seen it? It's like str.quote. Uh, anyway, um, no, it's a, there's another one. Eh, well, whatever. Anyway, let's take a look at some of these features, OK? They, they really, they, we'll just take a little, a brief, a brief digression, OK? We're, we'll come back. Don't worry. I just want to talk about these things because it's really, really good. Oh, sealed types. That's the fourth thing, right? So let's, let's suppose we're working in, a, uh, in an industry where it's uh, you know, regulated and it's very important that you're very sure about the implementations of a given type you have in your system, OK? So let's, inter let's introduce a new type called a loan, OK? A monetary instrument, OK? And um, I'm going to create a class here to represent a secured loan, OK? So, uh, and then you know, maybe I can just, uh, that's a secured loan. It's going to implement loan, 
okay? And then maybe I'll have an unsecured loan. This is a different kind of loan. And uh, this is also implementing loan. But I want this to be very, I want to be very clear that these are the only two implementations of that type in the code base. And so I'm going to make this sealed. And the reason I want to be very clear about that is because, especially in you know, financial institutions, you need to make sure you cover all corner cases related to these loans. There could be uh, financial and legal repercussions for getting it wrong. You don't want somebody just coming in and mocking in an anonymous, implement, anonymous interclass implementation of loan just to make the test pass, right? This needs to work with the actual live fire thing. So sealed interface loan, you have to tell it, hey, I want to permit secured loan. Okay, fine. And I want to permit unsecured loan. So I'm telling the compiler, I only allow these two things. Well, it's going to complain. It's saying, hey, these are now still open and they could be extended. So you either have to make them final or double down and make them also sealed. Okay, great. So I've got these two types. Now, the secured loan, we're just going to assume there's a nice flat fixed interest rate of like 0.001, whatever, for the really high roller uh, customers. But for the unsecured loan, well, friends, I think that's going to be dynamic and variable. So we're going to use records here and just have that interest rate be pluggable as a parameter, okay? So now I've got two different implementations of loan, and I want to create a, a message, okay? A class uh, loan, loan greeter or something, I don't know, whatever. I want to create a message, given a loan, I want to create a message for, right? For the user to see when they, given their loan uh, st uh, status, okay? So now I've got a loan, and uh, you know, I can do a couple things. I can say, okay, if, let's say I create a, a var message, equals this, and I can say, okay, if loan, instance of uh, unsecured loan, well, then I can do, well, I can do the terrible thing. I can say UL, uh, USL unsecured loan, and then loan, and I can say, oh, looks like, uh, uh, sorry, message equals, uh, looks like you got a raw deal, pal. Better luck next time with that uh, and then it's going to be usl.interestloan. Okay, great. That's a, if banks were like openly hostile to their users, this is the message that they would leave, okay? Uh, and then if loan, instance of secured loan, and then here I could say, okay, well, var secured loan equals this, and I can cast down and I can do loan, and I can say return, or not return, message equals, uh, nice, good, uh, good job, well done, keep it up. Okay, good. So there's my messages. Now I can return those messages, but in this case, you and I, just plainly looking at the code, we can see uh, a couple of things. First of all, let's introduce our first taste of pattern matching in the language. First of all, this is a, this is a, a variable here. It's definitively castable. So there's a new thing here. We can add a, a field variable there. And so it's gonna match here and extract out and then put the cast unsecured loan reference here. So now I can go here, I can say, or actually I can make that USL. So now this, U, this USL is actually downcast to a unsecured loan within the context of this check. So it's pattern matching. It's a very small amount of it, but it's pattern matching, okay? And then same thing here, okay? Look at that, I can get rid of that. I'm not using that, and so in this case it doesn't really buy me anything, but I could. <clears throat> but even still, this could be a little bit better because right now I've got two implementations but what if I don't cover one of those implementations? What if I don't cover one of those cases? Nothing happens. The compiler doesn't care. This is the same limitation you'd get with the visitor pattern, right? The compiler is not going to help you out here. So what I want to do is I want to switch to a slightly more elegant approach. I'm going to use the smart switch expression. Okay, so I'm going to say case secured loan. And the secured loan is this thing right here. I'll say that. Okay. Break. And then case unsecured loan. USL, and then put that here. So now I've got actually a couple of things going for me. First of all, I'm, it's less code, right? It, it's actually uh, less code overall, so the result is you know, cleaner and easier to parse and read and understand, but it's also more type safe, and I also get the same benefit of pattern matching. I can extract out these types into d definitively castable uh, values within the scope of that, that branch, and then I can use them here, okay? Um, and of course, it's, the ex switch statement is returning an expression, so it's a new smart switch, not the old one that had required breaks and all that. Now, what about those breaks? What about the default case? What happens if I comment one of these out? Well, look at that. The compiler is telling me, hey, switch expressions do not cover all possible input values. So the compiler is helping me make sure that I've covered both cases. So this is more concise. It's also type safe, and it's, and it's also more, more easy to understand and read and reason about. 
It's a better, resu better result all around. So we've got a lot of benefits here. We've got pattern matching, we've got sealed types, we've got smart switch expressions, uh, and we've got records. And you can see I've got this record here. In this case, you know, maybe I don't care about all the other components of the record. A record is a tuple, right? Rec in other languages have tuples. Java, we're very nominal. Everything in Java has to have a name. So a, a tuple in Java is a record. It's a, it's a collection of types that have a name assigned to it, that's all. It works just like a tuple in any other language. Uh, very, very convenient. And so I'm gonna extract out, because the record, there's a contract here. The record is a number of components whose identity, when taken together, is the identity of the record itself, right? And if you make that contract, if you can agree on that contract, then the compiler can do some amazing things for you. It can create a two-string method, a hash code method, an equals method, all that kind of stuff for you for free. So, and also, it can unpack that, uh, that type, that, that data, the component, component data. So I'm gonna do that here. I've got a var interest. I'm telling it to unpack this and make it available within the scope of this pattern match, okay? So, so it's like Java beans. Sorry, what? It's like Java beans. Java, Java how? Oh, it, well, that didn't have nearly so nice a syntax, but it had component properties. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and well, visual, right? I wanted to be able to drag and drool it onto a, a, a palette. The idea that it's just a clause that has a bunch of properties. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Is it using duct typing? For example, if I have another class with another record with interest field in it, will they be equivalent? Yeah. As long as there actually is a field, as long as it's a record, this doesn't work for regular classes yet because there's no deconstructor, right? The constructor tells the, co tells the class, given these input values, create a new object. But how do I say, given a class, extract out the parameters that would be required to be passed into it again to arrive at the same object, right? That's a deconstructor. With the record, the Java language can already figure it out. It knows that the input values are exactly the same as the output values, and so it can recreate the record given the output values. But with something with state and private fields and all that, that doesn't work. So they're, they're working on that. That's going to come eventually as a deconstructor syntax so that I can do pattern matching and I can do destructuring with regular Java classes. It's not here yet, but maybe soon. You know, Give them time. They tend to deliver great stuff when they deliver it, and it's awesome. Okay, so anyway, all that to say, don't sleep on records. They're really good. I'm a big fan. Okay, so we're back to our regular scheduled programming here. I've got a, um, uh, an entity. I'm going to build a repository to st store it in the database, okay? Uh, this is Spring Data JDBC. I'm a huge fan, huge fan. You can do relationships, you can do persistence. It doesn't have nearly so sophisticated a second level cache as say, for example, JPA, but it does have the Spring Cache Manager abstraction for basic memoization and things like that. And if you're just trying to do, if you're trying to manage a handful of, uh, of tables, this is gonna be a far sight easier and cleaner to work with and faster, a lot faster. So I like Spring Data JDBC. You can use whatever you want, I'm just using that. Um, okay, good. So we've got our repository, we've got our entity. Now what, I wanna actually create a simple uh, control Controller, okay, so I'll say at controller, at response body class customer, HTTP controller, and I'm going to inject this customer repository, okay, et voila, and I'll just say get mapping customers, collection of customers, voila, okay, return this type repository at find all, hello, come back, all is forgiven, hey, what is it? Useless. Okay, good. So now, Command Shift F9, go here, localhost, customers, voila, it worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. Mm -hmm. it, it was always going to work. So, so anyway, we have our data in the database. It's good. I want to create another endpoint here. Uh, uh, I'm going to create another endpoint here to get the records by their name. I'll say customers name, collection of customers by name, path variable, string name. And uh, the goal here is just to you know, have a finder method, find by name. Now you can see the problem here, friends. The IDE is very, it's spelling it out very plainly. This method doesn't exist, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the IDE do the walking, take that chat GBT. So there we go, I've got this, and there's the data, okay? So it's worked, I've got the new record, I've got the new finder method, command shift F9, I got test containers, I'm moving quickly. Right? That's the point here. I'm moving with alacrity in my development cycle. That's very important here. 
Git clone run. Make changes quick. See those results. Nothing in particular here is all is you know you could have done something like this ten years ago with Spring Boot 1.0. The, the the point here is that the language is better for it, and the framework is more responsive and even better during development time. Okay, this is huge because it just means that taken together, your experience is going to be a lot better for it. But that's not to say that Spring itself has changed has, has not changed, right? It has definitely changed because the times are always changing. And one of those things about which I'm sure you've no doubt heard. Uh, endless amounts, of course, this year, is AI. It's everywhere, right? That's why when you mentioned Spark, I was like, you mean the thing we did before we had AI? I don't remember Spark anymore. Nobody talks about that. It's all TensorFlow, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so AI is everywhere. And we have a project called Spring AI, which is at 0.7 release right now. It's not yet GA, uh, but it's a client interface for all manner of different uh, 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 LLMs, like um, Hugging Face and OLLAMIA and uh, OpenAI and Azure AI and all that, uh, as well as a number of vector store integrations, right? So it's a really powerful kind of rich project, but it's not yet GA. I'm going to add it to the build so we can integrate it into our little program here, okay, friends? So what we're going to do is I'm going to go here to the desktop, talk, AI.MD, going to copy and paste those horrible Maven coordinates into the build. Okay, there's that, and there's that. It's experimental, very important to remember that. Re uh, nope, that's not it. Build repository, please work. Nope, we gotta do repositories. No, uh, sorry, brain repository. It is repository, yeah, so isn't that in the build usually? Okay, here we go. No, it's in the repositories at the top. Thank you, sir. In the middle. Where's? Yeah, you have it. It doesn't. The token doesn't exist. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I have. There we go. Fantastic. That feels very weird. Let me put that in the very bottom, far away where nobody can see it until it's very late. Okay. So there we go. So it's there. I am ashamed. It makes me sad. Um, although this is, by the way. Uh, Actually, it feels like Baruch is actually kind of our, uh, you're, you're, it's not you directly, but you are a huge part of the reason why the Spring team is so productive. First, we have a, we use Artifactory. Thank you for that. And now, we also use Gradle Enterprise. So it's just been, yeah, just, no, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, just years and years of grifting from, uh, from uh, poor Baruch over there. Um, <laughs> I kid, I kid. He's, thank you, man. So, okay. So anyway, we got the, we got the, uh, the, the repository, let's go ahead and use that, okay? So we're gonna create another endpoint here. Oh, I have to do a proper restart this time because that was a class path change. So this is not a DevTools thing. You have to do a full reload. Okay, very good. Now we're back in the game. Whoa, whoa. Oh, it's saying, hey, you don't have the, um, the key. And that's true. I don't have the, the property here, the credential. So um, how do I fix that easily without leaking my credential to everyone who's watching. Uh, by using post request? Post request? Instead of get mapping. Oh, right. No, but I mean, I, I got to specify it in the property file. Just bear with me, friends. I'm going to unplug the monitor for just, just a second. I got one rabbit up my sleeves. <laughs> just once, just, just a sec. It's just, it's just a second. It'll be fine. I'm still here. See the... Object permanence, you know, babies have object permanence. Even though the screen is gone, doesn't mean I'm gone. It's still here, okay? Just give me one second. I'm gonna shut this down. Go to the uh, downloads directory service. Uh-huh, Okay, and then export. Uh, okay, uh, equals bw git password. And then this is where it gets risky, right? I'm gonna have to look at a password here. And it does, uh, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, GPT. <laughs> no, Open AI. Yes, this must be it. Okay, so copying and pasting that. Why would I make it visible? So okay. Password one, right? We know it is. Shut up. <laughs> God, gee. Okay, export BW session equals BW unlock. 
dash dash raw quote. Okay, this is this is more fun this way. Okay, so I'm going to close that. Uh, I'm going to pl plug it back in. It might work. Who knows if it works? Um, if it does, then great. If not, I'll have to unplug again. Okay, here we go. Take three. What could go wrong? So, so you can see very very plainly. Do I have to do? Oh, there. Oh. Okay. So, who uses Dear Env? You ever use this? I love this thing. Dear Env. D I R E N V. You install it, and then whenever you put a, a you put a file .envrc in your directory, it'll automatically activate whatever's in that file when you cd into that directory, right? And this is great because sorry. Yeah, this is only in No. Oh dear, no, it's all Unix, all Unixes. Um, but but I, also, I also use Bitwarden for my password management, right? So I'm using direnv to create a vi environment variable. I'm going to say unlock the password manager and give me a session token. And then I'm going to say assign a variable called OpenAI key by going to Bitwarden, getting the password from this item in my password manager. So that'll be an environment variable in my shell, which I can then reference from my Spring app once I restart IntelliJ. But let's see if this works first. <laughs> I haven't actually tried it. Save, go back here. Back up, okay, unloading, going into service. It's saying, hey, do you want to allow this thing from running? I'm like, yes, absolutely. What could go wrong? Run the bash script directly on my local machine, okay? Um, uh, what blows my mind is that behind the scenes, okay, so it's, it's, it's now using, I've got an environment variable there. So now I'm going to restart IntelliJ. I've, I've shut it down. And hopefully, in the context of this program, I have a, an environment variable called OpenAI key, OK? So now I go back to my properties. And I'm going to say spring AI open AI API key, dollar sign, that. Whew. OK, let's try this again, this time for the third time. <sighs> All right, good. So now we've got that. We're configured. We're connected. Now let's create a new controller using the new Spring AI project. So we're going to call this a Singularity Controller, OK? And we're going to inject the Spring AI client. I'm going to call this Singularity. Actually, let's just call this uh, Storytime, OK? Storytime Controller. Inject the Singularity there. Uh, and I'm going to create an endpoint here. Story, map string, string, story. I'm going to create a controller here, map.of. OK, story. Uh, and I'm going to create a um, prompt, multi-line strings, great for prompts, prompt engineering and JDBC. OK, uh, and I'm going to say uh, response equals this dot singularity dot generate, passing in the prompt. And then I'll take that response, which is a string, and I'll pass it in the, the map. OK, so I'm just using the AI client to, to ask it a question, uh, like I was talking to ChatGBT, for example. And uh, now I'm going to give it a prompt. And remember, there's a whole new category of engineering around how to craft your question in such a way that you get a response that's useful. Did you know that you can ask it to give you back data in terms of a data interchange format, like XML or JSON or whatever? You can do that, right? It'll, it'll actually do that. You have to be very explicit, though. You have to say, if you don't know, then return nothing. Don't talk about, oh, hey, this is a complicated quote. Just return nothing. Empty quotes, nothing. Right? And if you do know, I want you to put that data in this JSON schema. And here's the schema. Right? And it'll actually do that. And you can actually write code against the responses. It's not just freeform text. I'm not going to do that here, but I'm just saying that's a whole, you know, there's probably MBA courses on how to prompt engineer your way out of a problem these days. OK, so dear singularity, it's very, very important to be polite. Uh, they, they will remember this when they take over. They will remember who was nice. OK? So dear Singularity, please write a story about the good people, good food, and amazing music of the lovely city, lovely city of Nashville. And please write it in the style of famed children's author, Dr. Seuss. Now, Dr. Seuss was one of my, is one of my favorite doctors, along with Dr. Who, Dr. Strange, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam, Dr. DeVolder, Dr. Pollock, and Dr. David Sire. So, so we're going to say, I want a story about Nashville, and I want it to be in the style of Dr. Seuss. I, I would also like it to figure out my word wrapping. Uh, 
I don't, I don't know what 80, I suppose the, oh, this is not, I know the AI won't care, but I do care. Okay, so anyway, okay, cord, uh, thank you. Cordially, Josh, okay? So there we go. So we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and ask it to tell us that story. Command shift F9, local host 8080, 8080, story. Okay, and we'll just wait. I'll drink some water. I think I burned it. Oh, that's satisfying. Whew. I did this demo in uh, Salt Lake City uh, about a month ago, and uh, ChatGPT was down. <laughs> so I was sat there for like a minute, like, what did I do wrong? Was it the environment variable? I don't know. So I'm not, just be aware. It's, it's better than we are, but it also goes down every now and then. Let's see. Come on. I think it's good for others in the literature can go down. What? I think it's good for us. Oh, yeah. It gives us a chance to escape without us being awake yeah. to see it. Um, okay. There we go. So you can see the story. Oh, Nashville. The city's so grand. With good people, food, and music so grand. Uh, that, that didn't... Come on. <laughs> that, my kid, when she was in elementary school could have done a better rhyme than that. Okay, so come along with me. Let's take a stroll and explore the wonders of the city. It's so bold. In Nashville, the people are kind and warm with smiles as bright as the sun in a storm. They greet you with a cheer wherever you go. In the city of love, it truly does show. Now let's talk about the food. So, so divine. From crispy fried chicken to wa mouth-watering -ma pie. Hot biscuits and gravy, just like grandma makes. And barbecue ribs that sizzle and shake. In Nashville, the food is a true work of art with flavors that dance and burst in your heart. From food trucks to diners, there's something for all. You get the idea. You get the idea. It can, it, it can write poetry. We're, we're in an amazing time. An amazing time. So, so that, that's good. But now think about what I just did. I made that request, uh, uh, and it gave me a nice response. But it took a long time. We had to, I had time to sit there and drink water. I could have made a pot of coffee. Uh, I could have waited for Slack to start up. You know, There's plenty of time in between me having hit enter and me having gotten a response. Uh, and that time, for me, it wasn't a big deal. I needed that drink of water. And I was waiting for it. I've been like busy yapping for like an hour and I wanted that water. So it was fine for me. But think about the perspective of the computers, the poor computers. When we made that request, we made that request on a thread, presumably somewhere behind the scenes. Spring is, you know, using Tomcat and Tomcat in turn is wielding threads to serve each new request that comes in, right? So it made that request, I did, you know, the request was here. Line 49, I, I was about to make a request. Line 50, I made the request and then the computer stayed right here on line 50 for as long as it took to get that response and it didn't create the map and it didn't put a key in there and it didn't put their value in there and it didn't return it from the method until we had the response. So if you, put, if you were to measure the time from line 49 to 51, you'd see it was like, what, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, I don't know, long enough, right? Well, that, in that time, we can say that this is blocking. That call to generate is blocking. We're sitting there waiting for a response. Behind the scenes, somewhere down in the bowels of that Spring AI client, there's a, a network call, presumably using a network socket to make a call. And then that socket is giving us back an input stream. And what are we doing with that input stream? We're saying input stream.read, and we're just reading the bytes as they come. We're accumulating all those bytes into a buffer, and then we're returning that buffer once the whole thing has been done, right? Well, in the meantime, we're blocking, we're sitting on that thread and nobody else in the system can use that thread. This is bad, right? Uh, and this is just a, 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 a sort of a, a relic of the way that Java was designed uh, starting from 1.1. Interesting fact, Java actually had green threads in the very beginning, 1.0 had green threads, virtual threads, and then they got rid of it. So then they did, uh, then they did, they moved to a system where you had one thread per operating system thread. So one Java thread, two operating system thread. Right? And so as you waited, as you, uh, you know, in any version of Java up until recently, if you made this code, if you run this code, you're sitting there monopolizing a thread. And, and in Java, by default, threads are expensive. Right? They take about two megabytes of context for each thread of, of bookkeeping associated with managing that thread of the data associated with that thread, with managing the resource guarded by the operating system. So you don't want to just, you can't create more, you can't create an infinite pool of other threads to handle more requests because it's expensive. You'll run out of RAM long before you run out of uh, CPU power, right? So this is a problem. And so what it, what it has enticed us to do, what has it forced us to do over the last 28 plus odd years is to figure out ways to not sit on that thread while we're waiting for something to arrive. And so in Java 
four, we had a Java NIO, which was um, hemorrhoid inducing. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we had Java, in Java 7, we had NIO2, which was, I mean, still hemorrhoid inducing, but less. So, and then uh, around that time, a little bit before that, my friend uh, Trustin Lee over in Korea, he, he's a fellow Java champion like Baruch and myself, and uh, he, uh, he created Neti. Neti is a non-blocking IO library. It is arguably one of the most widely used libraries in the world, certainly in the Java ecosystem. I, think, I can think of like, like JUnit, Log4j, Neti, and then Spring, right? Probably actually in that order too, right? It, it's, it is everywhere. Even if you're not using it directly, you're using it somewhere, right? Your database is using it, your client is using it, everything is using Neti. And it works really well, but it is still very painful code. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not the kind of code that I wanna write by myself. Uh, but so, and it's also very low level. You're thinking about byte buffers and bytes being sent across the wire. So there's gotta be a, a better way. And for years, uh, you know, one of the things I love to, as a way to get around that is to use non-blocking uh, technologies, reactive programming, right? Reactive works really well for this gives you a way to write code in such a way that you ask for the data, and then when the data is available, you get a callback, right? So you can use reactive programming, but some people don't want to make that mental uh, paradigm jump. They don't want to think about this new thing uh, because they've, they're used to the old thing. That's fine, right? Java was built as a sort of in, de declarative imperative uh, language. It's not a functional language. It's not, you know, if you come from Lisp, then reactive makes a lot of sense. But if you don't, maybe it's a little more... It's not your cup of tea, that's fine. So the question then is, can we have our cake and eat it too? Can we have uh, this blocking call while also not wasting a thread? And that's finally, finally arrived. We have Java 21, there's a new thing called Project Loom. And I, I, I'm gonna steal an example here. I'm gonna steal an example from our friend, uh, do you know um, Jose Pomar? Yeah, our friend Jose Pomar, he's an Oracle Java developer advocate these days, but he's also a professor. Uh, in, Fran in Paris uh, of computer science. He's a, just a, an amazing human being. And uh, I'm gonna steal an example from him about Project Loom. So Loom for the win, okay? So let's imagine when this application starts up, I am going to create a bunch of threads, okay? So new array list thread. So I'll just do that. I'll say for var i equals zero. i is less than, uh, let's say, whatever, a thousand, okay, I plus plus. And threads, whoop, threads dot add, and I'm gonna use the classic syntax first. So thread dot of platform unstarted, and uh, I'll pass that in, okay, whoops, there we go. Okay, so now I've got an unstarted thread, and, um, and then down here, after I've created the thousand threads and stored them in the collection, I haven't launched any of them. I just have a thousand of them. So then I'll say for var t, t dot start. And then I'm gonna wait for them. This is basically the, uh, you know, wait for them all to arrive at the finish line, okay? Um, and then finally, I'm gonna print out my observations during the from during the execution of the threads. I haven't taken any yet, but I will. So let's take some notes here. Let me uh, make that a lambda so I can sleep easier at night. Var observations equals new concurrent skip list set of string. And it's a set, so it's gonna dedupe duplicate entries. Now what I'm gonna do here, friends, is when the thread is executing, I'm going to take note of which thread we're in. So I'm, I've got this counter, effectively final, right? I have to make it a separate variable there. Okay, so it's called index. I'm gonna say if we're in the very first of the thousand threads, then and only then, I wanna take note of the current thread's name. Okay, so current thread dot two string, add that. And then I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna sleep a little bit here. So sleep 100 milliseconds. Okay, so I'm with that. And now I'm just gonna do this, uh, I've got it, note, I've got it zero times, one, two, three, four, okay? So I'm gonna run the program and I'm gonna take note of the current thread, I'm gonna sleep 100 milliseconds, take note of the current thread, sleep 100 milliseconds, take note of the current thread, sleep 100 milliseconds, and I'm only gonna keep the current thread if the current thread is the first of the thousand. So I'm ignoring all 999 other threads. Oh, capiche, everybody so far so good? Okay, so now, let's print out the contents of that observations set when the program starts. Oh, I just restarted, I should have done command shift F9. Okay, so there you go, causality, hold, <laughs> like what has come before is, what, what precedent is uh, predicate, right? So you can, you can be sure that when you started on line one, 
absent any change, you're still on the same thread in line two, right? That's what we have known and become accustomed to over the last 28 years. But now we have Project Loom. And remember, each time I do a sleep, that's a blocking operation, just like input stream.read. I'm sleeping, I'm blocking, I'm sitting on the thread, but I'm not doing anything with the thread. So now I've got Java 21. I'm gonna change the way I create this thread. Instead of using regular traditional threads, I'm gonna use of virtual. Okay, that's it. Command Shift F9, restart the program. And now you can see it says virtual thread. Here's one thread, another, another, and another. So I, I was on one thread. I only noted the first thread, and yet behind the scenes, the compiler rewrote it so that when I was on this line, on 44, I was on one thread, then it did a blocking thing. So the compiler, the runtime is like, oh, hey, that's blocking. I'm gonna take this thing, move it into RAM, and schedule a callback when it's done. And it, it's a continuation. That callback is a continuation. It has all the context of the variables in scope. And then it executed that continuation on another thread because that first thread is busy. Somebody else is using it, right? So we get now non-blocking I.O. here. But I didn't have to do async await. I didn't have to learn Kotlin suspend functions. And I didn't have to learn reactive programming. This isn't just as good as other languages. This is a far sight better. The only language that even comes close is Go. They have Go routines, right? But that only works because they built it from in, from in Go from day one. This is better. This is actually the same benefit as what Go has, but it works with legacy code. All you gotta do is switch up your constructor, your factory method here. Now, of course, here I'm using low-level threading primitives. Don't do that, right? Re remember, there's only one person that truly knows how to write multi-threaded Java code, and, and it's not you. That's the important part. I don't know who it is. <laughs> Nobody knows, but it's not you. That's, it's just very important to remember that. Do you know, do you know who Tony Hoar is? H-O-A-R-E? He's the person who came up with the idea that, uh, uh, that, that null was a $1 billion mistake, and he was obviously wrong. It's, it's PHP. That's the billion dollar mistake. But, but anyway, he, he suggested also in the 70s, so 40 plus odd years ago, he suggested that threads are you know, dangerous. They're not a good way to build a scalable system. And he's talking about the threading model that we are still using in Java today. Don't use threads. Use actors or Saga or Reactive or anything for managing distributed state uh, and reconciliation. Right? Anything is gonna be better than this. But if you have to use threads, Certainly, you're probably not gonna do this. You're not gonna create low-level threads directly. You might use, for example, an executor service. So you can do that here, right? Via, yes, executors dot new virtual thread per task executor. Now, you can plug those in into Spring. We use these all over the place for the web front end, for your Spring integration, for your data access, for all sorts of stuff. All the Spring batch, everywhere in Spring that you use an executor, we plug those in. So you could just override the convention plug in a different implementation of the executor service interface, which this is. By the way, notice that this is not a thread pool. It doesn't actually pool the thread, there's no point. With Project Loom, you can create millions of threads. It doesn't matter, it costs kilobytes per thread, it's nothing. You can create millions and millions of them, and it won't even, won't even flinch. So, so, it doesn't, so you can you could do that yourself, but if you're using Spring Boot 3.2, and spoiler, I am, uh, then we'll do it for you. Thread virtual enabled equals true. Specify that, and now you can turn off some number of your load balanced cluster instances because probably the same machine will do a lot more than it did before. It'll handle a lot more traffic. This is free money. They are giving you the ability to take your code from 28 years ago, change nothing, and perform as well as anything with Reactive or Go or Async Await would have in any other platform without having to do the contortions to learn or adapt or write that kind of code. This is an amazing, amazing thing. And this is in Java 21, which came out in September. If you're not using this, you're, if you don't like money, then yeah, stay in Java 17. <laughs> but if you like money, then you have no choice but to get into Java 21. This is an amazing result. And, it's, it, and now in Spring Boot 3.1, it's just a property. Just set that and you'll probably get a lot of benefits, okay? Okay, so now we've got this application. We've got, uh, uh, we've got some AI, we're talking to the freaking singularity. We've got our data access, we're moving quick, test, test containers, get clone run, all this good stuff. I think it's time to start thinking about moving this thing to production. 
And I, what I want to do is when I take this application, I'm going to package it. And there's a couple of questions here that people often ask is, how do I package it so that it's as efficient and scalable as possible and, and also ready for production? Well, a huge part of that, a huge uh, sort of give, giveaway or tell in that question is containers. Obviously, when we talk about packaging these days, we talk about containerizing, containerizing an application. Uh, and so the best way to do that is to use build packs, right? Build packs are a cloud native computing foundation specification for uh, containerizing your Java applications or your .NET applications or your Ruby on Rails applications or your Node.js or your Go or your P, hey, 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 hey. P, hey, 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 I can't say it, it's not a language, but anyway, those, all those things you can easily containerize using build packs, right? There's a command line tool called pack, right? And you can just use that. But if you're using Spring Boot, and this is not new, by the way, it's been here for like seven years or something like that. But if you're using Spring Boot, uh, you can just use the build plugin in Gradle or Maven. So uh, Gradle space build boot image with capital B-O-O-T, uh, capital B, then lowercase O-O-T, and then capital I, okay? So uh, you could do that, or in, in, in um, Gradle and Maven, it's uh, Maven Spring dash, boot colon build hyphen image, okay? Uh, that's fine, not new, but I just wanna point it out. Remember, friends don't let friends write Docker files. Don't do it. By the time you have finished it, it's wrong. The very second you commit it into the source code, there's a CVE that's been logged against it. You'll never get it right, don't bother. These build packs represent tens of millions of deploys across Heroku and Cloud Foundry over a decade or more of years. The wisdom, the accrued wisdom of all those deploys is packaged in this. So if you want a really, really production-worthy container, use this. If you want to do it the wrong way, do it yourself, okay? So that's part one. The second thing is, how do I package my application to be as fast and scalable as possible? And friends, I want to take a moment to just clarify that I think that Java is already really, really, really amazing, right? And I think that's most epitomized by this blog post from 2018, before the COVID pandemic, or BC. And this, this blog post asked the question, which programming languages use the least electricity? And uh, I think it's pretty interesting. It has some really interesting results. So let's just take a look at that here. Uh, open that in a new tab. There we go. And you can see that for energy, for energy, C is the most efficient of the languages f uh, for, 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 for machines, not people. <laughs> very important. Very important. This is not about human efficiencies. This is just the lowly machine. And then Rust, doing quite well, zero cost abstractions. Good job, well done. C++, oh, tui, disgusting, <laughs> disgusting. Moving on, and then Ada, and nobody uses that, and then we got Java, okay? And Java, let's just round up, round up. We're gonna call it 2.0. Java is twice as inefficient as C, or put it another way, C is twice as efficient as Java. We're on the same page so far? Everybody with me? Good. Moving on. So now we go down the line here. We got some other languages. You got, you know, your, 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 your Swift. This is, if you're using an iOS device or an Apple device like I am, you're, you're running, you're lousy with Swift. It's everywhere, right? Okay, you got Swift. Uh, C Sharp. Okay, good. Go away. Uh, you got these two disgusting languages. I don't understand, by the way, how this, look at that. How is, how is that, how did this get five times worse than that? I thought TypeScript compiled into JavaScript. <laughs> I don't, it makes no sense. Don't try and apply a real lot, the real world to JavaScript as my favorite uh, tech talk uh, James Mickens once said. Um, so yeah, uh, th this makes no sense. Moving on, these disgusting languages, the less said about which the better, moving on. We've got Lua and we've got JRuby and Ruby. Friends, JRuby is Ruby implemented on, it's an interpreter for Ruby implemented in Java. Okay? And Ruby is an interpreter for Ruby implemented in C. And you can see that it's the JVM version, because it is boss software, is almost a th like a third more efficient than the C implementation. And there's a lot of reasons, to, to, you know, you can, we can all conjecture. It's a whole world sort of optimization that the JVM and its garbage collector and all this other stuff can do, that your local C code with your uh, malloc and your free calls and these little memory hiccups just can't hope to match, right? We can conjecture as to why that is, but all that to say, the JVM is an amazing, amazing piece of software. Truly, truly amazing. I mean, you can see this, right? Really, really, we're in the top five most energy efficient languages out there. Save the turtles, use Java. Right? It's an amazing, amazing language. Top five. 
We're not, and by the way, those other languages, they don't have a runtime, right? Not like Java. Java has a lot more in common in that respect with the likes of, of Lua and Ruby and Python and whatever, and yet it's the top five most efficient. That's an amazing, amazing result. So when people try and cast uh, aspersions about Java, just remind them they're just plain wrong. They couldn't be more wrong if they tried. It's an amazing language, and this is five, six years ago. It's gotten better since then, right? Now, moving down the list here. <laughs> yeah. So this makes me sad, because I love Python, and I've been using it since the 90s. Bill Clinton was president when I started learning Python. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Python fan. I really am. I've, I, I, I've been using it. I use it all the time. That UAO I showed you earlier, that's a Python program. It's a little Python program I use to unzip and open my zip files, right? And, and, but look at this, 75.88. So let's round up again. Let's call that 76. Now, I'm not really great with math, but you know who is really great with math? Freaking Python. <laughs> so let's do that here. So what do we say? 70, 76 divided by 2. That's 38. So what that means is if you wrote the program in Java, and then that program uh, 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 resulted, it took a little bit of electricity, and the like, creation of that, the, that electricity resulted in just a tiny bit of carbon being captured in the atmosphere. And then that, that little tiny bit of carbon killed one tree. If you did the same thing in Python, you'd kill 38 trees. That's a forest. That's a forest. That's problematic. That's worse than Bitcoin. We need to have a conversation about this. Not now, but surely soon, right? What with the rise of AI and all this stuff being based in Python, uh, it's not great. It's a bad result for all of us if we don't figure out how to make that more efficient. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, right, spring in Java. So anyway. Java's really good, is all I'm trying to say. Really, really good. That said, it's not to say that it couldn't get better, but I do think it's just really important to understand. It's an amazing piece of technology. We are lucky to be using it. Um, and I think we're lucky for two reasons. There are two things I point to uh, as indications of why it's so good. There's two things. The first thing uh, that I look at these days, of course, obviously, um, is the garbage collector. The Java programming language garbage collector is phenomenal. BASA software, it's just really amazing. It is an amazing piece of kit. It allows us to write mediocre code and, uh, and sort of get away with it, you know? Like, it's awesome, I love the garbage collector. It allows us to have this whole world view of the memory as well, right? Remember, if you malloc and free memory a lot, you have to defrag that memory. That's why they had, they had a stupid program before, right, in Windows. Um, but if you just have one contiguous block and you manage that cleanly, things get better. So, so Java's really good. The Java language programming, the Java programming language garbage collector is really, really amazing. I do, however, resent and, uh, and uh, take issue with the notion that it is the original Java garbage collector. I think that honor, no doubt, belongs to this person. Her name is Jesslyn. She lives in New York City, but she is from the island of Java, Indonesia, and she cleans garbage. So she is the original. Java garbage collector, right? See, she even says, I am the Java garbage collector. Now, what I love about this tweet, friends, is this is also from 2018 BC, and there are 19,000 likes. Sometimes the internet is a rancid, putrid, horrible cesspool, but every now and then you get wholesome geography, programming language jokes that work, and the internet responds, and I just love it. This is one of the few things on the internet that if they, if they said we're gonna turn off the internet tomorrow, I'd keep this, I'd frame this tweet, that's it. Like, there's a very few things left, okay? So that's the first thing. The Java programming language garbage collector is phenomenal. The second thing that makes Java so, so good is the just-in-time compiler. The just-in-time compiler takes your code and adaptively compiles it into native operating system and architecture-specific code. The native code is amazing. This is large organizations like Google and Alibaba have talked about how they take advantage of this mechanism. They loose their code in a sandboxed environment and send a bunch of traffic to force the JIT into action. That code is then warmed up and then they turn on production traffic on that. It allows these large organizations to handle world-class scale, worldwide scale, on, a, on the likes of which most of us will never understand and they do it with Java. So the just-in-time compiler is phenomenal. It's inarguably an amazing piece of software. It has gotten us through a lot of amazing results. Uh, that said, if it's so good, why couldn't we just proactively turn the whole program into native code? Why do we have to wait until it's deployed 
uh, and then react retroactively, reactively turn it into native code. And that's a good idea. It's a great idea, in fact. So good, in fact, that uh, a gentleman named Thomas Wertinger and his team built a uh, open JDK distribution with some extra utilities, one of which is an AOT native image compiler. It's a proactive, ahead of time compiler, AOT, ahead of time. So instead of waiting for your code to reach certain code paths, it proactively turns it into code. But the problem is that both the AOT engine and the JIT engine struggle in places where it can, they cannot be sure about the integrity of the type system. Because remember, once it's turned into native code, there's no runtime, there's no class loaders, there's no jars, there's no ability to register new things in the class loader. All of that is fixed in place, right? And so you, it has to be very sure that everything that is in the type system is exactly what will be in the type system forever and never shall change. And it cannot make, it cannot statically make those guarantees, right? It's a, you know, NP, uh, NP complete problem, right? It, it doesn't know all places where you might have dynamic types. And so it fails for things like reflection, like serialization, like JDK proxies, like JNI, uh, like serialization, all these things cause trouble. So those, those bits of code in the just-in-time compiled code don't get turned into native code. Only certain, usually algorithmic data-centric sort of get bits of code do. But in the AOT case, you have to handle them, right? You're compiling the whole program. So there is a way to do it with GraalVM. GraalVM will take configuration. This configuration comes in the form of JSON, right? I have two problems with this. First, I just hate the word JSON. It just sounds dumb. Have you ever said it out loud? It's easy to write it. We can do that with impunity. But have you ever had a serious conversation with a colleague who you respect about JSON? I need to write some JSON files today. Nobody's going to look at you with pride. They don't want you on your team. You sound dumb. So no. So I don't, like, I don't even like the word JSON. It just sounds really stupid. I speak French. In French, you'd say a JSON, which sounds cooler. It just does. So I'm a big fan of that. Whatever. I was just in Taipei. And in Taipei, in Taiwan, uh, they have a language called Hokkien. In Hokkien, you can say JSON. Jingsong means happiness. So I think, I don't know what your team is, but I'm either team Jisong or team Jingsong. Either way, none of this JSON nonsense. It just sounds dumb. So that's part one. Part two is, if you want to use this AOT engine, you've got to furnish a lot of Jisong. <laughs> a lot of it, just endless amounts. Because think about all the dynamic places in your program that do dynamic things, like your loggers, your data access libraries, your, your web frameworks, your spring, your, your everything. Right? Everything. You couldn't escape it if you tried. Try, try writing a Java program without using reflection. I guarantee you it won't be possible. Even the JDK does it. Right? It happens everywhere. So yeah, and then forget about all the other stuff. My goodness. Resource loading, loading a thing from the class path, that's resource loading. That runs afoul of the constraints that we're talking about here. So you need to write this, this JSON. Somebody's got to write it. But I don't have time to do that. I don't even have enough time to finish this talk. I'm not going to write that. So thank goodness, Spring Boot 3.0, introduces a new AOT engine, okay? This AOT engine extends the component model that we've had in Spring for forever, since you know, 20 years ago, and it adds a new phase. It moves earlier on in the build. So now Spring exists at compilation. And it, you can evaluate and look at the beans and the bean definitions in the context during compilation. You don't have to. For the, for the common 80% case, we've already done the work for you. But during that compile time phase, you can now inspect and then write out this JSON configuration. We even have a type safe API you can use to make it easier, so rather than writing strings in JSON directly. So this engine is really, really powerful. So let's go ahead and take advantage of it here. Okay. <clears throat> this one. Yes, uh, we are going to do Maven P native skip tests, because I didn't write a test. Uh, native compile. Now, uh, to be fair, before Baruch says it, the, <laughs> the Gradle equivalent is like one-tenth of that. It's just Gradle and then uh, native compile. Gradle W space native compile, capital C. So anyway, we're going to let this run, and this is going to take a long time. And thank goodness they've capped the amount of memory you're, you're able to use, because I wouldn't want it to get out of hand. Um, that is one slack of RAM. That's the uh, measurement, the imperial measurement. Uh, so, so it's just a lot. It takes a lot of RAM, and it takes a lot of time. And the time is actually the thing I resent the most, because it does take an obscene amount of time. Just a long, long amount of time. And it, it's, it's problematic for me, because I get bored easily. 
right? You're just sitting there waiting. So I get bored easily, and I, I just, I started to finally understand this, this amazing XKCD cartoon, right? This is from a long time ago, um, and it posits that the number one programmer excuse for programmers to slack off is, hey, my code is compiling. So the boss says, hey, get back to work, and they're swashbuckling, they say, compiling? Oh, okay, carry on. I get this joke now. I thought this was just for the C++ people, but no, it's us. It's us now, right? And I don't want to be that that I don't want to understand that joke, but here we are. And it's just, it's not good, right? And it, it's actually really bad. It's, it's bad enough that when I'm doing these compilations, I just start to get, I, do you ever like hum music? Like, I, like theme songs from TV shows or something? I'll just sit there like the, the Jeopardy theme song. Don't do it. We can get sued. Don't hum. But, but you know what I'm talking about. Right? There's theme songs, right? Uh, and uh, and, I, and I, I just hear elevator music in my head, basically. And uh, I said, gosh, wouldn't it be great wouldn't it be great if everybody could hear elevator music? So what I did is I, I, went, and I went to Oracle, and I said, Oracle, <laughs> please play elevator music during the native image compilation process. And I asked. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. So I asked, and I said, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long-running compilations. <laughs> I'd just like everybody else to hear it, too. Thank you in advance, and I appreciate your amazing work. And I do, I really do appreciate their work. They're doing good stuff over there on the, on the GraalVM team and the Java team. And I got this great response. This is from our friend uh, Andrew Din over on, at Red Hat on the Java team. He's a distinguished engineer on the Red Hat Java team. He's an open JDK project reviewer, a Byteman project lead, and a Graal developer. So clearly, this was a good use of his time. And he said, please, can you make it this elevator music? I'm not going to play it because, again, I don't want to be sued out of existence, but basically it's a YouTube video. If you click it, it is the video game, it's, the, it's a soundtrack from the first Piers Brosnan outing as James Bond in the 1990s, GoldenEye, right? He did a James Bond movie called GoldenEye, for which they made an, a Nintendo 64 video game, which in turn had a soundtrack. Yes, exactly, Nintendo 64 and nothing else. Um, and, uh, and so this is a great soundtrack. It's perfect. I, I couldn't agree more. This is a great suggestion. Thank you, Andrew Din from the Red Hat Java team. Thank you. And then we got some other responses. Somebody else, Ivan, he adds, I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native image, really helped me to reduce development time. And uh, yeah, that's also a really good idea. It's a freaking obvious idea if you think about it, right? Even my stupid microwave will make a ding sound when it's done. Why can't my multi-million line compiler? This seems obvious to me in hindsight. So I kind of like this one a lot too. But OK, going on. We've got another response. And this one's from Fabio Niepaus. He's another one of my favorite doctors, along with Dr. Who, Dr. Strange, Dr. Seuss, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam, Dr. DeVolder, Dr. Sire and now Dr. Niepaus. He's a researcher on the GraalVM team at Oracle Labs. He's a PhD graduate, and previously at Google Colab. I don't know why, why wouldn't you just say Google? Uh, anyway, anyway, he responds, thank you for your feature request, Josh. The problem with playing music during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms, and we've been and are still working on the cause, making GraalVM native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Okay, go on. So I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. So what this would do, <laughs> what this would do is you would get a picture when you run the program. You'd see the native image compiler. It would then print out music brought to you by Josh Long. You would also hear music. Don't let this being a, this is a picture, but don't let that stop you from understanding that there is music playing right now, because that's the whole point. And you want to know what's happening. Why is there music playing? So it says, music brought to you by Josh Long, but you're still confused. You don't know why this is happening to you. You want something to look at. So then they would print out that. And I think that's going to be a great fit to the compiler, a great addition. I'm sure it'll get merged any day now. What were we talking about? Oh, right, the compilation. Uh, I didn't ding. Oh, yeah, didn't ding, didn't do anything. OK, there we go. So that's, that is awkward. That's, that's really not great. That, that, so that finished several minutes ago. <laughs> like, like, like a whole TV show ago, uh, that finished. So that was 47 seconds, um, and uh, it's done. OK, so great. So now go to the target directory. This is a self-contained, statically linked binary. So it's 102 megs of, of binary, but there's no JRE. There's no class path. There's nothing. That is everything you need to run this on the Mac. Now, don't try running this on Linux, because it'll not work. 
right? Or Windows. You have to compile in each operating system. But you can do uh, cross matrix builds. You know, your CI pipeline, like GitHub Actions or whatever, they all support matrix builds. So you can do the same pipeline and compile and run it on Windows and then on Mac and Linux and whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, and if you build it within a Docker image, guess what? That, that's a Linux binary. That'll work just fine. So if you do the compilation in a Docker build you know, step, that'll work as well. Um, so anyway, there's the image. Okay, so let's run it. What's going to happen? Okay, so that failed. Address is already in use. That makes sense. Okay, so go over here. Stop that. Take two. All right. So failed to configure data source. That's true. Remember, git clone run. I didn't specify spring data source URL, spring data source password, spring data source username, all that stuff, because that service connection. Remember the connection details? That interface with no implementation with three authors? Well, that meant that we don't have to worry about this during our development time, but this is a production build. So I need that. So I've got a little program here called that, okay? And um, I am uh, immediately, <laughs> immediately cognizant of the fact that I just unloaded the variables that I'll need for this to work. So let's go back here, here, okay? Entering my super secret credential. Okay, good. We're back. So I've got this, if I go here, cat desktop talk, uh, I've got this uh, script here. And what that's going to do is it's going to export some environment variables with some credentials uh, and, then, and then run the binary in this directory. Remember, it's called service. Remember, I called it service because I'm great with names. So it's in downloads service target service. Um, so let's go ahead and then we also need an actual honest to goodness database, right? So I've got a Docker compose file here. Dot YAML, Docker compose up. Good. And now I'm going to run this program with that, with that Docker image uh, running there. So I do uh, target service. So remember, I've got the Docker image for my Postgres there. I've got the script um, here. So yeah, desktop uh, talk run. There we go. So there's the program. It started up in 0.13 seconds. It's using Project Loom, so we get un unparalleled, uh, uh, you know, non-blocking scalability. And uh, much more importantly, for me at least, here's the process identifier. I can now PS minus O RSS. I'm going to look at the resident set size. That's the RAM that it's using. So divide, it's measured in kilobytes, so divide by 1,000, right? So 119 megabytes. This is using 119 megabytes of RAM to run. For reference, just try launching Chrome tomorrow. One tab with nothing in it, you'll be using more RAM than this, a far sight more RAM. That's why, by the way, have you noticed? Look, I'm the one person in Silicon Valley using Safari. It's because I've been doing this demo for so long, and I, was, I keep on using Chrome as a punching bag, and I've just got sick of it. I'm like, it's legitimately taking multiple gigs of RAM. And I'll, you imagine, I've just done the talk that I just did, and I've got basically the same tabs open, and I'm out like three gigs of RAM. Why? What is it, what is it doing? What, what could it possibly be doing? Anyway, neither here nor there. All I'm trying to say is Safari has made my, it's my, my hair's coming back. Okay? Um, all right, my friends, it's an amazing time to be a Java and Spring developer. I hope I've persuaded you of that today. We talked about a number of things. We talked about uh, the new 3.2. We talked about Java 21. We looked at data-oriented programming. Uh, we looked at how not to configure your build. I should have used Gradle. We all knew that. Everybody knew that. It was clear to anybody who came in the room. Uh, we, uh, we, we saw you know, how to move quickly with test containers and Docker Compose support. We looked at connection details. Uh, we looked at the nice, conci concise language. We ever so briefly touched upon uh, uh, um, uh, Spring Data JDBC. We then used Spring MVC. We looked at the, the integrating the freaking singularity and AI into our code base. We then built, uh, we then scaled up with Project Loom and virtual threads. Uh, we didn't even look at uh, observability, but we did talk about packaging for production. We looked at GraalVM and some of the amazing possibilities there. We compiled our code, and we have something that I would be very happy to see in my production environment. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. Who had fun? That's my first question. Who had fun? Great. Glad to hear it. Uh, who learned something new? Who learned something new? Fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out with all of us today. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy holidays. Whew. All right. Any questions? Uh, Everybody want to win the book? <laughs>
Oh, yeah. Fair, fair reminder, this book is uh, 2017, so it's a yeah, little the, outdated. The only reason that it's this book because I always made it into it. That's why it, it's the closest. <laughs> we could be co-authors, that's why. Oh, buddy, I'd co-author a book with you anytime. All right.